the recording has begun. Great. <clears throat> Good evening. I am now calling the Tuesday, March 16th, 2021, regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to order. The time is now 7.04 p.m. President Mark Warren will be joining us later this evening. Please note that in support of physical distancing during the local public health emergency and in accordance with the Governor Newsom's executive order that relax Brown Act rules now during this public health crisis, we are conducting the meeting via video conference. Because we are video conferencing, we will follow a strict protocol for the benefit of the recording. I will indicate when the commissioners, staff, presenters, and the public will provide comments. If you have called into the meeting and are not using a webcam, please state your name prior to providing your comment for the benefit of the recording. Please practice considerate video, video conferencing etiquette by muting your, your line when you're not speaking and limit it distractive behavior on camera. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call. Thank you. Commissioners, I will be conducting all roll calls this evening in the same order. Please remember the order so that you are prepared to provide your comment or vote. Vice President Vaughn? Present. Commissioner Kearney? Present. Commissioner Sherlock? Joan, you're on mute. Sorry, present. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Spreen? Here. Commissioner Tyson? Here. Okay. And uh, five commissioners are present. Uh, Commissioner Tonka is not able to attend tonight as a commissioner pending some administrative matters, but she will be attending as a member of the public. And also for the benefit of the recording, I will conduct a presenters, consultants, and staff roll call. Assistant, Assistant Fire Chief Glass? Evening, present. Thank you. District Consulting Engineer Jeff Tarantino. I don't think he's on yet. Strategic Planning Consultant Scott. Here. Oh, here. No, thank you. Um, Emergency Services <clears throat> Manager Captain Gluhan. Present. Good evening. General Manager Logan. Good evening. Present. District Legal Representative Lead Deputy County Counsel Chelladen. Present. Thank you. You. And uh, CERT Program Analyst BB. Present. Special Project Service Consultant Hendricks. Present. Right. And the presenters, consultants, and staff are all accounted for. Great, thank you. As previously mentioned, I will be conducting tonight, tonight's meeting in President Warren's absence. President Warren plans to join us later in the, in the meeting. I would like to take a moment to recognize the district volunteers, Neil Caton, Neil is a dedicated volunteer making invaluable contributions to the district. He serves as a Red Cross volunteer and spearheads the Red Cross local disaster teams, which provides disaster recovery services to those who've been displaced in fires in Santa Clara County. As in March 9th meeting, the city of Los Altos presented a proclamation during March to, to American Red Cross Month in the city and recognized Neil's contributions to this area. The district and its partner agencies would not be able to provide the stellar services without the help of people like Neil. And we wish to take a moment, a moment to recognize his efforts. Thank you so much, Neil. And um, really appreciate your efforts here. Thank you very much, Commissioner Vaughn. Thank you, I really appreciate your service. We will now move on to item number, number three, public comment. Persons wishing to address the commission on any subject not on the agenda may do so now. Please note, however, the commission is not able to undertake extended discussions or actions tonight on items not on the agenda. Items may be referred to staff for appropriate actions, which may include placement on the next available agenda. District policy is to limit public testimony to three minutes per speaker, unless the number of speakers requires the commission president, president to impose shorter time limits. Do we have any public comment on items not on the agenda? Hearing none, we will now move on to item number four on the consent calendar and changes to the order of the board of the commission, commission's agenda. Okay. And commission, or uh, Jay, um, did you want to swap out four with 12 now or? Um, yes, I, I would be glad to do this. Uh, just go ahead and maybe adopt the consent calendar if there is no, um, 
no change in the consent and then I'll, I'll make the changes in the uh, order of the agenda. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, move to uh, approve draft minutes of February 16, 2021 regular meeting. Commissioner Spreen moves. Carney seconds. Okay. Uh, so uh, Vice President Vaughn, we can actually have a motion to approve the consent calendar in total. Yeah. If you wanna request a motion from the commission gotcha. to do so. That way you don't have to read them all. <laughs> gotcha. Is there anyone who'd like to make a motion on this? That was, that was actually my intent uh, to move the entire consent calendar. Okay, do I get a second? That was my intended second. Gotcha. All right. Um, roll call vote. Okay. Uh, Vice First, President. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess it's a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Any comments? Hearing none. Okay. Okay. Now we'll move to roll call vote. Uh, Vice President Vaughn. Can we just confirm that there was no public comment as well? I it wasn't clear to me whether that was just commissioner comment versus public comment. No one appears to be um, asking to make a comment. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, Vice President Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Kearney? Yes. Commissioner Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Okay, and the motion passed with five with one absent. Okay. And so we have a request to remove uh, or move item 12 into place now. Uh, is that correct, uh, Jay? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would like to move item 12A which is the operations, the fire uh, operations overview and orientation presentation by Santa Clara County Central Fire Protection District command staff on countywide services and programs and projects provided in partnership with Los Altos Hills County Fire District for fire protection, suppression and emergency medical services. I'd like to move that to follow item 6A, which is to receive the Santa Clara County Fire Chief report, monthly report for February 2021, and doing that in respect to um, Chief Glass's time uh, and to make his, his two items for the agenda uh, sequential. So thank you for that change to the agenda. That's the only change to recommend. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay. And Mal, President, uh, Vice President Vaughn, can I also make a request um, to remove an item from the agenda? Um, item 11B, the revised draft budget narrative for fiscal year 22. Um, I was not able to complete it due to uh, just a very crazy tax season. As you know, I'm a tax preparer um, when I'm not here. So uh, there was I guess you could say time management problems on my end. So I would like to instead bring that back to April's meeting. No problem. Um, everybody got that removed item number 11B from the agenda for tonight and will be moved to uh, next month's uh, April 2021's meeting. Vice, Vice Chairperson Vaughn, I don't think you need to take a vote. Maybe just you can move those items and just ask if any members of the commission have any objections. Gotcha. Um, to copy Chris's uh, language, does anyone uh, have any objections to the movement of uh, item number 11B from the agenda tonight or any questions? Hearing nope. none, the item will be removed and postponed to April 2021's meeting. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move to um, item five, and that's the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Administrative Monthly Report on County Committees. Okay. Items 5A and 5B on various re monthly reports presented to the county, county of Santa Clara County. General Manager, Manager Logan, please provide the report. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, President, so uh, item 5A and 5B are the uh, monthly management audit reports. And I just wanted to comment that President Warren, Commissioner Tyson and I met via video conference with newly elected Supervisor Otto Lee, who chairs the FGOC committee. And we provided an overview of the district and responded to his questions. And the meeting was held helpful since the district presents this monthly report pertaining to the progress on the management audit recommendations and also submits the report in a PowerPoint presentation to FGOC. Supervisor Lee had reviewed the district's 2021-22 strategic plan goals and objectives and also reviewed the district's forward-looking community resiliency chart that depicts district's programs for integrated hazardous fuel reduction and programs for prevention and protection and the functions chart that is necessary to support these programs. All programs are intended to build community resiliency and are founded on fire science the Los Altos Hills County Fire District's CWPP built on strategic plan goals and resources resourced by the district budget. It was very gratifying that Supervisor Lee had reviewed these foundational documents prior to our meeting and thus provided the platform for our exchange of ideas. Um, I think that's very important to set that into the record as part of what occurred in, uh, in March for the February reports. And then I would just uh, comment that um, if President Warren or Commissioner Tyson would like to add to my comments, I would appreciate that. Sure, let me go ahead. Uh, yeah, and you know, this helps. I, I've known Supervisor uh, Lee since the early 2000s. And so we, we bumped up into each other in, in the past. So it was very, very good to have this uh, meeting. And I'm, I'm really glad that General Manager Logan set it up. We had a very nice dialogue, a question and answer. It wasn't just presentations. And, and he showed a remarkable diligence as I think you just heard. And then also a certain humility. He told us a little anecdote about his first ship experience when he was in the Navy where he served for 28 years. So really good first strong meeting. And I think we, we helped explain a little bit more of the history and, and how we got to where we are today. Great. I wanted to also mention that FGOC, uh, the February report was um, um, uh, was received on consent and that the Hewlett committee will receive the February report from the district on March 25th. And then the comments uh, from management audit division regarding the district's February reports state in conclusion, we believe that the fire district has implemented or is on track to implement the audit recommendations as adopted by the Board of Supervisors. So I think, you know, Commissioner Tyson, that's very gratifying to us uh, because you're with me when we give these reports and, and I think we're making some good progress and maybe reclaiming the credibility of the fire district and also putting forth the story of, of what we do in our all of our efforts to follow the management audit recommendations and strengthen the district by accordingly. Thank you. All right, good job guys. Um, thank you so much, uh, General Manager Logan. Is there any other discussion from the remaining commissioners? Hearing none, how about uh, public comment? Any members of the public like to comment on this uh, discussion? Hearing none, um, we'll move on to item number six and um, and received the Santa Clara County Fire Chief's report. All right, um, good evening, uh, members of uh, the Fire uh, Commission, excuse me, uh, and members of staff and the public. Um, uh, today we'll present the Santa Clara County Fire Department monthly report for the month of February, 2021. And if we can move to the next page. Um, we're seeing a slight uptick in call volume for where we were one year ago. This is as a result of COVID-19. We were entering in the uh, early uh, stages of COVID-19 with the shelter in place orders. So we saw a drop off in calls right around this time. You see we're at 114 last year, but the 147 number is pretty consistent with where we were in years previous, um, 2016, uh, 17, and 18, we're, we're tracking right around normal average for February. Um, we are at 75 calls total uh, for the fire district since the start of the year. 
Uh, pretty average breakdown, 50% EMS, 25% service calls, um, obviously with a greater number of calls uh, being seen during the daytime between the hours of eight and about five in the evening, and then it slowly tapers off. Uh, the pie chart illustrates the percentage of calls as they're broken down. Uh, once again, response times look really good. Um, we're shooting for seven minutes, 59 seconds in the urban density, and you can see we're well below that with an overall grand total average of under Oh, right at six minutes and six seconds. And then for our rural densities, that's 11.59. And of course, we're well below that uh, coming in at, gosh, almost 5.36. So outstanding uh, response times. And total dollar loss value was $3,000. And it uh, looks like we did four programs for a total of seven staff hours, which uh, we estimate uh, reached a contact group of about 100 per, uh, people. Uh, and you divide that by four, we're looking at about 25 people per, per interaction. And slide three uh, shows an overlay of the call volume. And again, there was some public comment received by both the general manager and myself. And I'll go ahead and speak to that briefly. Um, the representation of the dots that you see on the map are from a, a data set of what the fire department was dispatched to. And what we report in page two is what we actually found. So there might be some disparity where we were dispatched to something that was a fire, but when we arrived, it was actually not a fire. So the map may show a red dot, but we didn't actually have a fire when we got there. So that is uh, some of the discrepancy. I know that was a question that was brought forth uh, by Mr. Epstein. I appreciate the, the question and I hope that we were able to answer it for you. Um, and I will forward the uh, response from Deputy Chief Kirkow, who does our data, data analysis, so that you can take a look at that. And with that, I'll take any questions as it relates to the uh, monthly report. Vice President, you're muted. Any discussion from any of the uh, commissioners? No. I'm sorry. Just saying no. Gotcha. All right. Public comment. Any members from the public would like to comment? Hearing none. Great. Thank you so much, Chief. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. Now, uh, bear with me. I'm going to try to uh, accomplish item 12 now by sharing my screen and kind of walking through this. And if this fails, I have a short video um, that we can watch, which pretty much covers it all. But I feel like it'd probably be better for us to talk through it. Oh, it wants me to give permission. Okay. I apologize, I don't appear to have the ability to share my screen. So would it be possible for me to transfer this to a different computer and then come back to this topic? Yes, why don't you let us know when you're ready to go. And, okay, uh, give me a couple minutes here and I'll work on transferring this to a different computer. Yeah, and Chief, if you need to email it to me, yeah. um, you can feel free to do that too and I can put it up for you. Okay, outstanding, thank you. And then uh, can you just make both of these platforms host so that I have the ability to, when I am ready to share, share? Yes. Thanks. Great, thank you, Chief. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to item number seven, seven uh, A and seven B, uh, General Man Manager Logan, please provide the reports. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vice President Fawn. Um, just before I start my report, I would like to recognize uh, also Neil Caton and his service to the broad community of the American Red Cross. And Neil, we're very proud of you and thank you so much for helping our community and, and doing all that you serve. Uh, just very touching and very much appreciated. Okay, so the cover slide, I depicted here the three photos that are from our PowerPoint presentation to the uh, county committees. I thought that that would be a nice representation on the cover slide. And then slide two are the events that took place. And uh, you'll see that I've mentioned here the special meeting with district association 
that was hosted that also hosted newly elected supervisor Otto Lee, and then uh, the convened separate meeting with Otto Lee to discuss that I discussed previously in my remarks. And then I wanted to mention a meeting that occurred today, and I and Captain Gluhan attended the Fire Safe Council Board of Directors meeting. And it was really quite, quite an interesting meeting because we heard reports from Cal Fire, from Central Fire, and various reporting parties involved with fire readiness and wildfire suppression. And I wanted to share my observations from attending that meeting. And that is the remarkably changing landscape of fire science and influences in the field of wildfires, such as the insurance industry and the insurance companies and also technologies, and particularly the dramatic impact of climate change and the ongoing drought conditions on forestry, all of which increases likelihood of fire fuels in our environment, and that's going to increase wildfire events and the severity of wildfires. Uh, also discussed at the Fire Safe Council meeting today was a countywide evacuation plans and the use of zone haven for the eva evacuation platform and for the communication system. So from this meeting, I'm hopeful and have reached out to various presenters to have them lined up for our April commission meeting, that's April 20th, on some of these topics. Um, excuse me. Fire Safe Council uh, will present uh, at the April 20th meeting and their emerging fuel reduction programs and hopefully a representative from Zone Haven will discuss opportunities for district residents um, and, and talk about that, that platform. So Captain Bluehan, do you have any comments that you could provide? Thank you, General Manager Logan. Yeah, and again, to just kind of um, impact that we've known in Los Altos Hills, one of the, um, Cal Fire Chief's report was on the amount of dead trees. They, they watch in the East Bay, because uh, it kind of is an indicator uh, with little different fuel models. So they expect the same kind of drought um, effect to a lot of the trees in Los Altos Hills, which we've already seen with the Monterey Pines. So again, the importance of continuing our chipping program. Um, I know that the Fire Safe Council's budget in Saratoga was a little bit uh, less than, than past years. So they didn't have as much chipping that they were able to offer. So Again, keeping our robust programs that we're offering to apply fire science through HIZs, our shaded fuel breaks, evacuation route, uh, hardening, things like that, that we have continue to do uh, in our collaboration with Fire Safe Council. They also are inviting us uh, to speak with tomorrow, actually, with the Highway 35 um, uh, groups. There's actually three collaborations of counties in that group, uh, speaking of, of hardening Highway 35. Um, along as a evacuation route and possibly as a fuel break in the future. So we don't have the same uh, situation where 280 is a uh, fuel break box that they draw around a fire in the east, which was in the uh, CZU fire. So really important that we keep those collaborations, uh, mid peninsula, all those types of things that we continue to do uh, with Fire Safe Council and, and those opportunities. Thank you, General Manager Logan, and yeah. a report. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, thank you. So um, as you know, Los Altos Hills Town has um, appointed a task force and that's led by council member Lisa Schmidt and uh, Captain Gluhan and I met with her uh, this last couple of weeks and to talk about just an overview of the district's fire safety and what her vision is for the task force. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to align our programs as a fire district that resides within the Los Altos Hills town and for them to align with us. And so council member Schmidt's topics that she revealed to her constituents and to the, the residents at a very high level, I uh, put them there, copy pasted them into this slide. And I think you'll find that they're very much the kinds of, of interests that the fire district has, which is to accept, uh, to, to a, um, to access the WUI designation, put the WUI designation back into place for the town of Los Altos Hills, um, to review town ordinances. And as you know, Captain Gluhan and I appeared in front of the council, oh, I guess it was about a year ago now, recommending the R337, which is the higher standard of building codes. 
And then also pr prioritizing fire hardening actions, which is certainly a, a um, thrust of the fire district. Evacuation plans, we're going to hear a lot more on that. Establishing ongoing communications and education to residents, the district, that's one of our main strategic plans. And then participation in actions by the state to increase fire insurance availability. Um, the district started that outreach about a year ago now with Fire Safe Council, uh, help to talk with um, State Commissioner Laura uh, for having some kind of acknowledgement for properties that have hardened themselves to be able to continue their fire insurance uh, or to be able to receive fire insurance for their properties. And then um, uh, Council Member Schmidt is interested in determining how to measure success for the task force. So I just wanted to go over those topics. Um, Captain Gluan and I have a meeting. Again, we're gonna meet bi-weekly with uh, Council Member Schmidt. So I think we're on to a really good dialogue and we'll pull various partners into that conversation. Fire Safe Council is going to join us in the next meeting. So thank you, next slide. And then I just wanted to announce to the commissioners that MRG, which is our consulting uh, services firm, uh, has, uh, you heard from their records management consultant, and uh, I did sign, execute a proposal with that group for uh, uh, services for records management. And as you recall, their consultant spoke with you last month and talked about uh, what you'll be doing uh, for the district on that. The services are approximately $4,000 and that will be as a part of the total service allocation for that uh, consulting. So that is um, the end of my uh, report, unless you have any other questions that I can answer or any clarifications I can give here. Thank you. Thank you for that report, uh, General Manager Logan. I had a quick question. Uh, when the insurance commissioners, when you guys are in discussions with them, is there any talks of any possible moratorium or halt on cancellation of existing policies within our area? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think they're looking more globally statewide, but uh, we're certainly trying to get the insurance industries from a statewide perspective to move away from these cancellation policies and also to bring more of the insurance industry back into the fold. Right now, a number of the insurance companies have dropped out and they're just not offering insurance. So if we can get more competition, but it's not gotten down to a local level, it's just more on a state conversation level right now. And I'm going to be attending a hearing with uh, Commissioner Laura and uh, in, in a couple of weeks and I'm going to get a lot more information. So let me report back to you on that. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, unless Kevin Bluehan, um, Denise, do you have any comments there? Cause I know you're following this quite closely. Yeah, the, basically right now, the only areas where they have moratorium on non-renewals is areas that were impacted directly by fire. Uh, even though CZU is close, it's only areas that were actually impacted with zip codes is by zip codes you can get on the state insurance commissioner website and it says the specific zip codes that are in a moratorium on, on non-renewal, but it's not a, a general statewide. It's just for those people impacted closely by fire. Thank you. Great, thank you, Captain Gluhan. Uh, any other comments from other commissioners? Any comments from the public? I just wanted to mention that uh, when I was in the planning commission, the town had made a decision to uh, get out of the WUI. And uh, uh, at the next council meeting this Thursday, I will be bringing the WUI back uh, for discussion under council initiated items. And my hope is that we will engage in a dialogue about whether we should bring the WUI back. You know, the reality is that we've already started, uh, we, we already have enhanced standards. So what we're doing is we are, you know, we, it's costing us more to build a home. So we're already doing that part. We are not getting the benefits of the WUI. So I personally, I think it'd be a good time to have that discussion. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments? Any I think comments? just briefly, um, I think having Lisa involved as well as Kavita um, in really setting safety standards again. And I think that they'll be more open to us sending communications out through some town um, networks that we haven't been able to before, which will be great. 
great. Thank you. Any other comments? Any more comments from the public? Great. Thank you all. Chief Glass, are you ready to jump back in? Yeah, if that's all right. Let me see if I can uh, do the screen share this time. Uh, only one participant can share at a time, it says. Here we go. All right. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I apologize for that inconvenience. Um, now, let me see. How do I make it move? There it goes. Oh no, it's very slow. Some of this might be my internet connection, but um, well, getting into this is an overview of the Santa Clara County Fire Department, which provides regionalized emergency services and support um, to the largest county in the state, in Northern California. Our mission uh, for the Santa Clara County Fire Department, uh, it exists to provide, protect lives, property, and the environment from fires, emergency incidents, and disaster through preparedness, prevention, education, and emergency response. Uh, since the district was founded in 1947, we, along with the Board of Supervisors, have worked to provide a regionalized emergency service system, and our service boundary has expanded and contracted over the years, um, and as the county has developed and partnered with different communities to take advantage of the regional approach. Uh, today, Santa Clara County is the largest county in Northern California by population with nearly 2 million residents. Uh, it is one of the most diverse, technologically sophisticated, and highly educated counties in the United States. Roughly half of the population lives within San Jose, um, the city limits, and is served by the San Jose Fire Department, uh, the largest and busiest fire department in our county. The other uh, half of the population lies within 14 other cities and unincorporated areas where county fire is the second largest fire provider within the county and the only organization to actually provide service across many of the different jurisdictional boundaries and all levels of government. Uh, while it is a challenging uh, model from time to time, we fundamentally believe it's the most efficient way to deliver fire services. Uh, and since our beginning in 1947, we advocate for the regional model of efficiency to serve the communities. Not only do we have emergency fire, EMS, and rescue services as part of our response model, um, emergency dispatching uh, 911 services of fire, EMS, and law occur underneath the jurisdiction of county fire as we provide executive level leadership at county communications, as well as the county office of emergency management and the county fire marshal's office. Um, the combined uh, fire district uh, is made up of five uh, indigenous cities and then contracts for service for a total of seven communities served, including two different districts, which we'll touch on as we move through um, the whole entire layout of the fire district. Let's see if I can make this go. All right, we'll try this video real quick. Santa Clara County Fire Department operates 15 stations covering 132 square miles and serves over 225,000 residents. We serve a diverse population across geographical areas that range from densely populated metropolitan areas with some of the most technologically advanced companies in the world to rural hillside communities with significant wildfire risk. As an all hazard fire district, our ability to respond to emergencies of all types and sizes is key to protecting lives, property, in the environment here in Santa Clara County. Our commitment to service extends well beyond our cities, towns, or even the county. When our neighbors need us, we're there to help. And we're there prepared to continue to support our neighbors and mutual aid partners throughout the state while maintaining our capabilities here at home. Santa Clara County Fire Department is not just the responders you see. It's the teams behind those responders who keep our equipment running keep our residents informed and ensure that our agency continues to move forward responsibly and sustainably. Even during most challenging times, we're here planning, preparing, adapting, while continuing to provide the high level of service and dedication that our residents have come to expect. Our department has become an integral part of each neighborhood and each community we serve, and we are very proud to be your Santa Clara County Fire Department.
Okay, so the, a fire district overview. Uh, we're going to kind of take a little bit of a deep dive into the fire district now. Um, the county is basically, uh, fire district has basically grown through annexations and contracts. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Central Fire District's emergency response is provided by 15 stations that are marked by yellow dots on the map on your screen. Um, the west side of the valley is predominantly the red area, which is considered zone two for the fire district. Uh, coverage includes the cities of Campbell, Cupertino, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, Monasterino, Los Gatos, Saratoga, and the unincorporated areas in the wildland urban interface. Central Fire District is a department is a dependent fire district with the Board of Supervisors sitting as the elected Board of Commissioners for the fire district. It's the only district in the county reporting directly to the five member Board of Supervisors. The district was cut in half in 1970s resulting in zone one contracts. San Jose Fire Department provides service to large areas of Central Fire District, primarily in the Alum Rock, Almaden Valley, and San Jose, uh, South San Jose areas. The red areas along the north, uh, along the southern and eastern perimeter of the city of San Jose are referred to as zone one. So that would be the east foothills that border the dark blue area. Uh, fire prevention, disaster preparedness, 911 services are, are provided to all of the unincorporated areas. And so you can see everything that's in blue is covered by those services. So a significant portion of the, the county, basically everything except the valley floor, Gilroy and Morgan Hill, are covered by county fire in some form or another. Uh, the red portion on the west side or the left side of your screen as you face it is covered for emergency response. The blue is fire marshal, 911 dispatching, and yellow outlines the fire stations. The little bit of red on the east side, we contract that to San Jose and or Milpitas, and that's a zone um, tax dollar straight pass through to those jurisdictions who provide that service. However, we retain fire prevention and fire marshal service within that area. Okay, so we serve seven of the 15 cities within Santa Clara County. Um, and let me see here, my screens are not lining up. Um, the seven, seven fire stations in seven of the county's 15 incorporated cities, which is the West Valley community, as well as the unincorporated Santa Cruz Mountains near Highway 17. These stations are situated to provide rapid emergency response, and they are named according to the community and neighborhood in which they sit. So we also contract primarily with San Jose for the zone one contract, which we discussed in the East Foothills. Fire stations are neighborhood resources, and there's a fire station located approximately four to five miles to every four to five miles to ensure that we provide rapid response to life-threatening emergencies. It's a response system. It flexes and contracts based on the type and size of the emergency. We're constantly moving resources around to address emergencies and close coverage gaps created by emergencies. We've not added a new facility since the addition of the seven string station in 1997. So the fire district did add um, had Morgan Hill for service, but that went away in 2012, and now that's covered by CAL FIRE. Uh, it just didn't make sense for us to serve that island down there, so now we have the, the incorporated um, contiguous border on the West Foothills. The next slide is going to talk about our system and how it always flexes. This allows the system to move and maintain response time standards within our jurisdictions, and it ensures an ability of regional system coverage. So every station that has a gold star on it is a core station. Uh, all the other stations are considered non-core, but they are vital to the operation. So as we have holes developed within our system, we will take apparatus from some of the existing stations and move them to the stations with a gold star. This provides the most central location and ability for us to maintain our response times that we hold ourselves accountable for with our EMS contract, as well as our standards of cover document. Um, approximately 20,000 calls per year, the fire department, the fire district responds to. Um, and again, we're right around 50 to 58 to 60 percent EMS calls, 25 percent customer service, 8 percent fire alarm. Uh, 1.7 are actual fires and hazardous conditions, 2.6. So as we give you the monthly report for the Los Altos Hills uh, County Fire District, you will see these numbers very accurately reflect your jurisdiction as much as it expounds to the entire jurisdiction. The communities are not uh, immune to EMS calls. They're not immune to customer service calls. So it doesn't matter how much 
we try uh, its very level playing field across all of the communities. So you would think that Campbell, because it has maybe a younger demographic, doesn't experience the same amount of EMS calls, but that would not be true. Uh, EMS calls on, on average are about 60% of the call volume of the entire district. And as you saw tonight, I think we were at 58% for Los Altos Hills. So um, we see this average pretty, pretty consistently across the, uh, the entire district. So the next slide is an overview of kind of how the fire districts came to be and then the different contracts and how they all integrate within our system. And this can be a relatively confusing uh, diagram. So I'll take my time and walk through it and feel free to ask questions. The five cities on the right hand side, Cupertino, Las Gatas, Montesorino, Saratoga and unincorporated zones one and two are part of the original central fire district created in 1947. Those uh, city managers and our town managers report directly to the fire chief and he has an appointed liaison. The contract cities are on the left side or districts. So we have the Los Altos Hills County Fire District, which is a dependent district underneath the board um, that contracts for services with central fire district for the operational component. City of Los Altos also under a 10 year contract. City of Campbell, also under contract. Saratoga Fire District, which is an independent special district within the county, also contracts for operational fire and life safety response. And then of course, with this county of Santa Clara, we contract, they contract for, uh, to us for services for fire marshal, communications, which is 911 dispatch of fire, EMS for the whole county and the sheriff's office. And then the Santa Clara County Office of Emergency Management for the entire county is also a, a, a overseen by the fire chief. And he reports to the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. So that's kind of an, in a nutshell, this flow chart here of how it all come, comes together. This one's a little bit easier to understand. This shows the fire chief and align how it goes out to the different directors that he oversees, County Comm, Office of Emergency Management, Business Services, um, personnel services is the one on the far right there. And then of course, uh, I, I report to the fire chief and then I oversee operations, training, fire prevention, admin planning and support services. Let's see if it goes. I don't know why I can't change slides. There it goes. Okay, operations. Operations. Okay, operations is just like it sounds. This is uh, emergency response, fire, life safety, EMS, urban search and rescue, hazardous materials response. This is your all risk, all hazard. You pick up the phone, call 911, and a fire truck shows up at your door in less than seven minutes and 59 seconds in the urban area. That's what our goal is. Uh, again, we uh, pride ourselves in courtesy and service and making sure that, you know, anything that the public needs, we're there to support them through this. And that's in all of our jurisdictions. This is to protect life, property, and the environment. Uh, some of the things that we're pretty proud of is the advanced life support capability. Every piece of equipment within Santa Clara County Fire Department has uh, a paramedic on it and can deliver the first 30 minutes of care. Same as if you walked into a hospital right on your doorstep um, in, a, in a rapid fashion. Again, um, paramedicine. So we have EKGs, cardiac, over 40 different medicines, purse tools, uh, type one hazardous materials, type one urban search and rescue. These are the highest levels that you can attain. So when you go to Los Angeles and you think of their ha heavy rescue or their hazardous materials units, they meet the same standard and criteria that our USAR urban search and rescue and our hazardous materials team meet. So again, 20,000 calls per year in operations that we handle within the 132 square miles of the fire district. Let's see. Trying to go to the next slide. There it goes, fire prevention. Oh, man. I'm not sure what's going on here, I apologize. Okay, fire prevention uh, is a multi-pronged approach of engineering, education, and enforcement. Education, excuse me, engineering is plan review, fire protection engineering for suppression systems. Education is our CPR, our personnel, emergency preparedness, our safe sitter programs, our fall programs, fall prevention programs. And this is administered by our community education or risk reduction staff. 
Enforcement is our fire investigation. We contract for arson investigator service with Campbell Police Department and have a staff of our own um, cause and origin investigators that respond out to fires within the jurisdiction. These services are provided to the communities we serve as well as through the County Fire Marshal's Office for unincorporated areas. So just a brief overview, 17 facilities, over 132,000 square feet of real estate, 95 different fleet vehicles, 58 types of engine and other apparatus. And I won't bore you with all the types and kinds, but um, count, uh, Santa Clara County Fire has uh, every type of response vehicle of a modern progressive fire department. So from fire engines to fire trucks, to off-road fire engines, to small size, medium size, um, we call them, we type them, type one being the largest, type six being the smallest. We've got everything in between. We have water tenders, we have, um, you know, 13 type one engines, six type three engines, three type six engines, uh, three staff truck companies, one type one hazmat, three type two USARs. So again, um, we have a myriad of vehicles and trained personnel to be able to respond to any and all hazards or emergencies that present themselves. We're also in the middle of beginning a new station rebuild at Redwood. And we have about seven different stations in various stages of updating and modernization to meet uh, ADA compliance uh, to address some, um, you know, uh, some of the uh, gender neutrality issues that we're facing in the fire service, converting rest, uh, restrooms from male only and female only. Uh, so we're addressing a lot of those different concerns within our, uh, our facilities. Administration and planning kind of oversees, just like it sounds, uh, administrative duties, our ISO rating, our uh, international accreditation, which we just completed, as you see in 2021, it's a five year self audit process where we go through and we peel back the layers of the organization, have an independent review board come in and assess, are we really doing what we say we are doing? And then uh, once we go through this very arduous one year process, uh, we then are accredited. This is our fifth straight accreditation. So for the last 20 straight years, um, the, we are out there actually proving that we are delivering these services just the way that um, you know, we're printing them here on the, on the paper. So uh, it's an independent audit. We put ourselves through it. It's a huge heavy lift, but we're very proud of our 20 year history of, of uh, successfully navigating this. There are, we are one of 150 agencies in the state of California, uh, excuse me, one of 150 agencies in the nation that have received this. And uh, of that less than I believe 20 are in the state of California. So next page here. Okay, county services, as I've already touched on this, 911, fire law, EMS, county fire marshal, and office of emergency management all fall under the auspices of the fire chief. And those are all through direct contracts with the county of Santa Clara. Um, operational area coordinator, Santa Clara County Fire Department, including the fire chief's office, uh, serves as the regional mutual aid coordinator for Santa Clara County. Uh, this is our operational area. We are part of OES Region 2 South. And we participate in the CFA agreement, which is a California Fire Assistance Act or agreement. Um, and this is where we send resources from within the county, uh, either to other agencies in the county that need assistance, or we will send our resources out of county to support the large fires that you see. So we had resources on the SCU complex, we had resources in the CZU complex, we had resources in the LNU complex. Every agency, every fire engine in this county, if it leaves, is under the, the um, you know, authority of the fire chief or the operational area coordinator who, it could be me, it could be one of our other deputy chiefs, but those resources are tracked, assigned, and committed through our communication center, and they travel anywhere in the state of California. We have even sent apparatus as far north as Washington, Oregon, and as far east as uh, Colorado. So we, we travel around and we fight the fires and it really truly is neighbor helping neighbor. There's a comment in there about 2310 Charlie. That's just a name of when we group five of our engines from County Fire and send them somewhere, we call them that, that name. And so we're really proud of that. There was a picture in the video of the five white fire engines all lined up. Again, I don't wanna get too down in the weeds with the technical terminology, but. 
um, that would be what's called a strike team. And so one of the apparatus that is assigned to the El Monte fire station, engine 374, is usually assigned to that grouping of resources and sent around the state. So uh, while it does say Los Altos Hills on the door, it, it, you guys are participating in that uh, regional uh, and statewide mutual aid. Um, I think in the essence of time, I'll, I'll probably stop here if uh, the commission is uh, acceptable with that. Each slide from here on out goes into detail of every fire station and in order to save save everybody. Unless you find value in learning about every single fire station in the district, I'm happy to talk about it. Or perhaps you'd just like me to speak to El Monte Fire Station as an overview, and then we can end it. Um, I'll, I'll take direction from the vice president or general manager. Great. Um, excellent report, uh, Chief Glass. Um, I've actually been a, been a commissioner, for, I believe, for about seven years. And so I wasn't even aware of all the, the things that you guys actually do. And so it's uh, very um, welcoming to see it all on paper. And you, you, you go back and, and, um, and, uh, and just kind of reassess all the things that you actually do, you know, uh, you know, coming from being, being a firefighter of 30 years myself, um, it's, it's pretty amazing what you guys have been able to accomplish, especially the accreditation and uh, the, the limited amount of departments that are actually accredited in the state of California. So um, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, so thank you very much. I'd like to comment too, if, if I could, Vice President Vaughn. Um, it's just remarkable and Chief Glass, thank you so much. I'm just so pleased and so proud that this commission and district is a part of the greater good and the greater whole. And I hope you really accept our appreciation. Thanks, you know, for you being here every month with us, and leading us through, answering questions, always being so service oriented, and the partnerships that we're building together now, um, really very gratifying. And, and I thank you for that. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate being part of um, you know this family that is the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. I was assigned to this about a year ago, and I came from being the city of Cupertino's liaison, where I served for two years there. Um, and again, I was a battalion 74 battalion chief in Los Altos and Los Altos Hills. So again, um, I, I do really appreciate, like I said, being part of this family. And I do think it's a wonderful partnership between Central Fire and County Fire. I look forward to our future together. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any other comments from other commissioners? George? No, I was gonna. I was gonna not make my comment because uh, Chief Glass has heard this before, and that is, whenever you get a brush masticator, will you let me drive it? But I wasn't gonna say that, but you just forced me to do it. But. You know, Commissioner, I'm interested. Uh, I think Cal Fire is releasing the grants coming up, and that might not be a bad uh, grant submittal for either the district or or Central Fire District, or maybe even a partnership. So uh, I'm open to the idea, and uh, we get you the training and the safety gear. I think you'd be uh, it'd be great out there. Great marketing tool. All right. <laughs> Any other comments from the commissioners? Hearing none. How about the public? Any public comment on the presentation from Chief Glass? Hearing none. Thank you guys very much. Really appreciate it, Chief. Thank you. You're very welcome. And Vice President, I believe Commissioner Tonka was speaking. Oh, sorry. Yes, it's my fault. I muted myself accidentally, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief Glass. Uh, we really appreciate this partnership and we look forward to seeing what we can do with this going forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. General Ma Manager Logan, did you want to go ahead and do uh, 12B while we're um, on subject matters that pertain to uh, fire suppression? Um, so uh, no, we're going to hold 12B for the end of the agenda. And um, uh, engineering consultant Tarantino and I had that discussion earlier, but uh, we will just go back to the regular order of the agenda now. Great, thank you, General Manager. Uh, item, uh, item eight, the emergency services manager report. I think that's where we are at this point. Yes, um, and that would be uh, emergency service manager Gluhan, uh, Captain Gluhan and uh, Sir, Program Analyst BB, can you guys please provide those reports? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Vice President Vaughn, uh, commissioners and the public uh, and staff. Thank you. Staff is helping me right now. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Uh, my first slide, I'll, I'll do um, my portion. And then we have a special guest joining us tonight uh, with Victoria's presentation here towards the end. Um, these are some of the interfacings that we've had in this last month or some of the, the uh, meetings and programs we've been involved with. Next slide. For events and activities for this month. Um, a lot of them are normal regularly scheduled meetings. There's some CERT. Uh, as um, General Manager Logan mentioned, we went to the Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council meeting uh, today and we already gave a report on that. I'm also attending uh, regional fire safe council meetings uh, for Sky South Skyline, San Mateo and Santa Cruz County to kind of get uh, what's going on in those neighboring communities because as we've already uh, mentioned several times, fires don't respect boundaries. Uh, so we want to find out what's going on in those. And I want to keep a, an idea along with our open space partners like Mid Peninsula, their resiliency uh, planning meetings uh, for their regular board meetings. Um, we also attended the town council meeting last uh, month and uh, a lot of discussion uh, was on public safety, uh, generally uh, or initially with the uh, police uh, department, sheriff's department, and then uh, secondarily with fire safety and, and different uh, items. And that's where we came up with the task force that uh, council member Schmidt is uh, now heading that we're continuing with that we spoke of earlier. Uh, we continue to go to biweekly uh, public information officer meetings, which basically uh, all stem around uh, COVID and vaccination around COVID. Additional meetings, uh, CADRE, I'm gonna show you a slide in a minute, a little bit of what CADRE is. So if you don't know what that acronym is, hold tight. We continue to do GIS uh, technology integration uh, meetings. One of the items that was brought up, uh, the CEO and Chief Glass presented the Zone Haven, uh, which is pretty close to being rolled out uh, here in the countywide and specifically in the Santa Clara County uh, towns and cities that are represented by County Fire. We look forward to integrating that also into our uh, new GIS technology that we're uh, getting up and ready to, to start utilizing uh, collecting data in. County meetings, again, uh, attended the, um, some of the meetings that have already been talked about today, including the state of the county uh, meeting. And uh, one of the things that came out of that is there's a, it was prior to the county allowing uh, youth to participate in sports again, Santa Clara County was more prohibitive than the state and they were talking about the increased amount of um, attempted suicides and completed suicides among the youth in Santa Clara County and the inability to even uh, put someone on a hold locally. They have to go outside the county. So we'll talk about something that we've kind of come up with to maybe help counteract and improve community in that age group. Um, and that's coming up a little bit later in this presentation. We did an evacuation workshop in the uh, Madero Oaks neighborhood last month, really well um, attended. We hope to do an evacuation drill and possibly encourage Firewise community, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute also. Again, I've already alluded to the mid pen open space. Uh, strategic planning meetings are ongoing. Uh, we're meeting with individual commissioners where I can be of assistance or, or General Manager Logan and assisting with their goals and getting those developed and, and then uh, marched out with timelines and benchmarks. Um, we've also, um, I had the, um, the youth council meeting uh, this uh, past March 7th. And I'd like to really thank uh, Mayor Tonka about being uh, one of our guest speakers and really uh, giving some insightful information to the youth. We had approximately 40 something uh, youth on the, the youth conference. It was on a Sunday. Uh, it, was only, it was a very short one. Last year we were supposed to do a really uh, nice preparedness focused uh, presentation with some um, stations, four stations, but unfortunately with COVID, and again, this year with COVID, it's downsized into a virtual meeting where I talked about preparedness in my portion and some leadership. And then we're, we talked about introducing the subject I'll talk about around the youth in a, in a bit. I don't want to take away the thunder. I'll let it just kind of be a secret unless you've looked at your packet. Um, we continue to uh, also work on uh, getting our SOPs, uh, how we do business as an organization. And that's being set up with FNL and, and uh, Jeff and General Manager Logan can speak to those if we have questions. Some upcoming meetings, I continue a uh, meeting on uh, fuel break planning. So I've met with crews from El Monte Station. I kind of went and asked them, where are the streets that you do not want to hear a fire being dispatched? 
And around that, I looked at what are the major thoroughfares that connect into that. And then I'm working with uh, retired uh, battalion chief uh, Jim Young from Fire Safe Council on starting the planning. And we have a meeting uh, first part of next week to get our plan started for our next project. And I'll let you know what that project is at our next meeting on the 20th of April. Uh, we continue to do the neighborhood evacuation meetings. Firewise certifications is ongoing. Uh, we have the workshop coming up, which I'll show you uh, in just a moment, the flyer for that. And then we can uh, have the also the brush, abatement, brush and weed abatement letter that was sent out by Santa Clara County Fire. I have an, a sample of that in just a moment that I will put uh, up on the screen. Let's finish out this slide and then I'll bring those letters up after this next slide. If you could forward for me, Sarah. So I, I talked a little bit and we're gonna have an actual presentation next week by um, a member of the Fire Safe Council. But one of the things that I presented this month was to the Emergency Communications Committee, again, one of the standing committees from the town. And we talked specifically on what, it be, what um, you have to do to become a firewise community. So I just kind of, met, since I keep mentioning that, I wanted to give you the kind of the overview of what that takes. Uh, it's the six steps here, uh, forming a committee. And that's mostly what we get when we have those workshops. We already have some of that already formed. There's a risk assessment that's done either by the fire department or in this case, usually by Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty standardized form that they go through and do a, a pretty in, intense risk assessment. We have to host at least one educational outreach event and that is the evacuation workshop that we initially start with. They develop as a board and a community, so a, a multi-action year plan. And again, that's around those priorities defined in that risk assessment. And this is the cool one that we having our robust chipping program. This is usually where most communities struggle and we offer this in our chipping program. This is that investment they're talking here is you have to have some kind of finance in some kind of chipping program, but the district's already providing that. So it's one of the easier steps uh, for our communities versus some of the communities in the county. And then one of the last things is that they develop this portal, uh, submit their application and they actually get uh, recognition. Uh, this is an NFPA National Fire Protection Agency um, program. Uh, so it's a nationwide program, but they get local and statewide recognition. And then there's annual continuing education that goes along with that. And that's worked into that multi-year action plan. So again, the, at the bottom there, there's the uh, link to the Firewise, if you want to look at that. And it talks a little bit about uh, the program uh, in more depth on the Fire Safe Council website, which we have links to on our website. Last uh, slide, I think, for me or maybe next to last. I mentioned CADRE, and in case you haven't heard of CADRE, again, it's not legitimate unless we give it an acronym. So the acronym for CADRE is the Collaborating Agencies Disaster Relief Effort. And it was organized around the 1989 uh, Loma Prieta earthquake. So this is a VOAD that actually helps, which is a, a state-run program, helps support uh, emergency events inside this county, specifically for Santa Clara County. Um, it's, it gets together all kinds of community-based or CBOs uh, to get together uh, to have a, we talk about passing around business cards before an event. That's where you get to have all these resources registered prior to an event. So if you need someone speaking a different language or you need a faith-based, they're all there listed in this, this resource that Cadre maintains. They've done a lot of uh, uh, symposiums, uh, COVID-19 webinars, preparedness webinars, they do an award every year. They're involved in the Great Shakeout. A couple of their, uh, there's a few of the activations they've been involved in. I'm not gonna go through those. You can read those, uh, they're here in the notes. And again, uh, they have a really nice newsletter. If you go on their website, you can find the link to that or it's here down at the bottom. Next slide. I think we're to the letters, Sarah, is that where? I believe, so this is a yeah, sample letter. Okay, perfect. This is a sample letter that was sent out to all of um, the, the uh, cities and towns inside Santa Clara County Fire. This one is specifically for Los Altos Hills. They are uh, deemed for the area that they're representing. So if you're in Saratoga, it'll say Saratoga. If you're in the WUI for Los Gatos, that your letter will say that. And it'll be a little bit different according to uh, those needs of that spe specific area. You should have this if you're a resident of Los Altos Hills. So all the commissioners should have received something like this. Um, and it talks about the requirements. If you'd like to scroll down, I'm not gonna go into all of these right now. One of the key points that has changed in the last few years because of fire science is the region. And we've gotten quite a few questions. 
that's the zero to five region that's right around the immediate home or structure, say if it's an alternate dwelling unit or an ADU, that also counts as a structure. And the recommendation, they found that the fire behavior, especially with embers moving ahead of a fire and a wind-driven fire, find a receptive fuel bed, uh, dead vegetation, leaves that are accumulated when property hygiene isn't done well, and it gets in that little area of that zero to five feet, starts an incipient fire, which ends up burning up and, and eventually catching the house or some furniture, or some kind of a combustible component of the house. So the recommendation moving forward, and this directly came from uh, our Governor Gavin, Gavin Newsom and the Insurance Commissioner Lara, is to start uh, mitigating and doing property hygiene in that zone. So there'll be a lot of education around that moving forward because there's a lot of questions and it is new. Go on, we'll scroll down to the last item that I will talk about. And that's the, I mentioned that there's the uh, wildfire preparedness. Again, we have are doing all of these virtual. Uh, last year we were supposed to do them in person. They got canceled because of COVID. But the Ready, Set, Go program, this is all being put on by County Fire in collaboration with other agencies uh, like Fire Safe Council. Um, and then you can see there is one specifically about uh, homeowners insurance. So as more information comes out, they'll be adding that to that and you'll hopefully get the most up-to-date and current information. And then they'll be talking about recovering from wildfires, uh, which will actually have people that have, will talk about what they encountered in having a fire in their area. So you have to get online to Eventbrite, uh, go for Santa Clara County Fires, FC, SCCFD Eventbrite, and you will be able to register and you do need to pre-register for these classes. I think that, yeah, and again, this is just more of the letter uh, that came along. There's a couple of different um, severity zones. We have the 30 foot and the 100 foot. So the letters are a little different depending on uh, what measurement and what category that, that you've been put on according to your assessor parcel number and mapping that you get distributed these letters. So that's good for the letters for now and my presentation because I wanna really move on to our CERT presentation, analyst um, Victoria Beebe and her special guest tonight to talk about some exciting new programs that the district and the town are supporting here in Los Altos Hills. Thank you. Good evening, uh, President Warren and Vice President Vaughn, um, staff and public, thank you so much for um, having us, um, my report, and sorry, I had the wrong date on there for some reason, but it's for today. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. So what we're gonna start off doing tonight is we wanna talk to you about our teen CERT program that we launched last week. Um, I have my um, teen CERT ambassador, Mihir, here tonight, um, and we'd like to welcome you, Mihir. Um, and he's going to present our Teen CERT program. Hello everyone, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so we're just gonna be presenting the general overview of the program that we've started recently this year. Next slide, please. Um, so the purpose of the Teen CERT program will be to essentially teach the teens emergency preparedness um, and the skills that they would need to protect themselves and assist others in the event of an emergency. So with the knowledge that they learned, then they could also, in addition to like during the emergencies, they could also help others be better prepared for the emergencies. Um, so as for who is responsible for the teen CERT program, it will be the parent if the teen is over 18, or sorry, under 18, but if the, if the teen is over 18, then they'll be responsible for themselves and they can be a disaster service worker or DSW um, without any parental approval. Um, so for, as for who will monitor and run the teen cert program, it will be the town of Los Altos Hills, which will be um, handling the administrative paperwork and making sure that everything we're doing is within the legal limits. Um, and our supervisor will be Ms. Beebe, the uh, Los Altos Hills County Fire District General Program Analyst. And for managing the members of the Teen CERT program, we will have an appointed board. So here's the timeline. We are hoping to finish and finalize the board by April. And meanwhile, students will be taking the online class and finish around June mid-June and then in June we'll be having two skills days where the students will get to apply their learning in a hands-on environment. 
So these are the board positions that we'll be having. There will be an application and interview to decide the who will get these board positions. The term will be one year. And so for the first year, for this year, we're going to be appointing the board positions. But the hope is that in the future, it will be elected positions. So I'll be the chair of the board. So I'll essentially be overseeing all the teens operations and making sure that we're on track, making like um, executing on the timelines, all that overall stuff. Um, the vice chair will be responsible for um, helping lead the board meetings. And they are the person that steps in if for whatever reason the chair is absent. So they need to have a really good understanding of what's going on within the program and they need to be working very closely with the chair. We also have the secretary treasurer, which is pretty self-explanatory, and the public relations and communications team. So the public relations and communications team will be responsible for outreach and social media. They'll be creating flyers, sending out emails, just basically spreading awareness about this program and how to be better prepared for emergencies. So the Teen CERT curriculum has eight units with the final unit being a final exam to test all the knowledge that they've learned throughout the course. Um, the course will cover units such as fire safety and utility control and disaster medical operations. And so we'll be using the hybrid CERT curriculum at the University of Utah. I personally have started this program and I think it's awesome. And it, it goes super much like into the details while also keeping it interesting. Uh, the training is 16 to 18 hours, not including the skills days. With the skills days, it'll be about 36 hours. And students that take the course can receive community service credits for graduation. So on the skills days, we acknowledge that COVID might still be an issue. So in order to mitigate that, we're gonna be having temperature checks and screening questions every single day. And we'll also be doing something called pods. Of course, we're gonna be following the guidelines, face masks, social distancing, and I have listed some other um, precautions for the skills days on the slide. So for the pods, it's basically gonna be grouping people into small groups. Um, it'll be four students, one instructor and one helper. And it, this is basically to prevent if for whatever reason COVID does spread, which will be extremely unlikely, but if it does, then it'll be contained within a single pod and it won't spread to other pods. So we'll be having the skills days at the CERT ARC on June 11th and June 12th, and it's at Foothill College. So some of the benefits of having Teen CERT include um, parents becoming more aware about, because parents are aware of the teens activities, they will also learn about how to be better prepared for emergencies and it's spreading awareness through to, throughout the entire community through the teens. Uh, in addition, teens bring fresh ideas, thinking and motivation, which means that maybe they end up changing some existing system because of the new perspective that they bring. Uh, that's pretty much it for my presentation. Does anyone else have any additional questions? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, the great presentation. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, I think it's a great opportunity for the youth to get involved in the community. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. Um, what's a recruitment process? Um, I, I may have missed that part. If you could just elaborate on that, please. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so it's initially been through um, just kind of word of mouth. I've let all my friends know and then I'm like, okay, let your friends know. And it's kind of been spreading like that. Um, we currently have around 60, over 60 people interested in the program just from one school. And so it's been, so, so we're planning on releasing flyers to, or sorry, we've already released flyers um, through social media and emails. And we're just kind of spreading the word um, like that. Um, recruitment, they have, we have like, right now we have an interest form where the, the teens will fill out and be like, okay, like here's my contact information. I, will, I want to be updated with any updates from the program. And then right now we're currently in the process of registration where the teens are, that have signed up already are going to be 
um, registering for the course and they're starting to take the course now. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other commissioners? Uh, uh, Commissioner Spreen and then Commissioner Tyson both have questions. Um, I'll go, I suspect I'll say the same thing George might, but I think this is the coolest, most exciting thing I've heard in quite a while. Uh, if we can pull this off, and I love whoever figured out that this can fulfill teens' uh, community service hours, brilliant, just brilliant. What a way to get people involved in their community uh, pragmatically. Uh, I'm very familiar with, you know, the town has its own youth commission, and I've seen what that does, but this is so well targeted. I'm, I just want to say hurrah. I, I thank you for being here and giving a presentation, and I hope your energy carries through to bring many more like yourself to us, but that great job. Thank you. Well, let me just echo that, Mahir. By the way, you didn't mention what school you go to. I'm kind of curious. Oh, I go to Los Angeles High School. All right, great. Yeah, so I'm, great. A, I'm a junior right now. Go Eagles. Go Eagles. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Really good presentation. Tremendous program. I'm, I'm just thinking, why didn't we think of this before? And you know, Mahir, <clears throat> when you say the benefits of teen cert, number one, the parents of teens get involved. It reminds me, and I'm sure everybody else here, when your teen learns how to drive and suddenly they start noticing your problem, the things you do wrong, I suspect we're going to see a lot of that where the, 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 your, the teens are going to say, you know, we could be doing this or we need to plan for that. And yeah. so I, I'm really a strong supporter of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just like to add to that, just a good on you for taking a leadership position and helping pull this together. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to say that none of this would have been possible without without Miss Beebe. She has been amazing, and I couldn't have done this without her. You're right. Thanks, Mahir. Thank there. you. I'd like Mahir. to. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Jay. I'd like to echo that too, and thank you, Victoria. We've been working how many nights on on <laughs> pulling all this together, and also Denise. But I wanted to make the comment also that in doing this program, yes, we're looking at and training young adults and youth for CERT, but we're also doing something I think even more important, and that is espousing the values that we have to our young adults. And one of the things we talked about is the value of inclusiveness. And in, in, when you asked the question about recruiting, Vice President Vaughn, that was very important because any student, any, any young adult can come join Los Altos Hills Teen CERT and be included in that cadre, in that, that collegial outreach. And I think, and I said to Victoria and she and I agreed that what's so important is we're showing inclusiveness, not exclusiveness. And that is a main value that we want to teach and we want to make a part of this uh, training opportunity. So thank you all and, and, and thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, General Manager Logan. Um, Dr. Kearney has a question as well. <laughs> Who's that? Brilliant uh, presentation, Mahir. Really, very proud of you. Um, will the teen certs deploy with uh, regular town cert? So there is the. It's, it's a little. It's a little complicated. Um, I think the main thing is that if there's an emergency and you know there's no first responders, sometimes there may not be um, adults around. The teens will be able to help, um, and they will know what to do. Like they'll be able to direct others. Um, I think something that um, is makes it a little bit difficult, something that like still needs to be kind of figured out, is that um, the parents will need to be um, with the teen when the teen is activated. Um, so that's that's something that we still need to figure out. Um, I know Miss Beebe knows a little bit more about that. Would you like to talk about that? Sure. So um, that's correct. If they're under eighteen, they have to have their parent come to supervise them on an activation. Um, uh, so we're working on, um, well, we already actually just launched an adult hybrid CERT program as well. So with the hopes that if you have to go with your teen, you might as well learn it too. So I can happily report as of, uh, five minutes ago, we have, uh, 10 adults and 12 teens signed up for both programs. Um, and that's, has not been a huge push. We're working on some background uh, paperwork issues, um, but that is solely um, here uh, pushing on information. I actually got a phone call today from somebody who heard from somebody about a team program we might be starting here. So uh, the word is getting out, um, but yes, Terry, that's, that's the hope is that we're going to be working alongside each other. 
And yes, I just like to really point out Mahir has been instrumental. Uh, like I said, we, he's gotten 65 kids to sign up. He's been getting the board members, um, you know, straighten out that you better, you know, get people recruited. And um, he even, uh, we talked for a couple hours on a Sunday because he had a great idea to start chapters in all the different schools in the county. So I really think that, um, you know, we found a great teen ambassador. I'm really excited that we are able to push this program out. So thank you, Mihir. Good job. I look forward to us, you know, moving forward and, and uh, getting some more kids. But yes, to Jay's comment, um, we are going to be pushing this program out to the other county um, CERT programs. Uh, I'm working with Marsha uh, Hovey from the town on sort of how we're going to manage that. Um, but, you know, this program is uh, one of a kind and unique right now. So um, I'm really, really excited about, about being able to launch this. Victoria, did you want to go ahead and finish up with the general CERT report too? And mm -hmm. then if we have any further questions, thanks. So just to kind of go over some of the events and activities, I've obviously been doing a lot with the CERT hybrid program. So that's uh, taken a lot of my time this last month, um, but um, I'm still chairing the uh, monthly CCL CCLT program manager meeting um, and getting presenters for those meetings, uh, really trying to unify um, our, our CERT programs in the area. A lot of us use different kinds of paperwork, um, et cetera, et cetera. So just trying to get everyone sort of on the same, the same page and unify, which they've been trying to do for um, a couple of years now. Um, I also attend the, the PIO meetings um, as well as I have every Wednesday, basically I have either a training that I've um, run or a general meeting or a supervisor meeting. So we're still on that, that path for our CERT programs. Um, I also took the hybrid CERT class for the University of Utah. So I would know what um, the recruits are seeing. So um, that was pretty interesting. Um, I also had to do a program manager training, which I completed as well. Um, we're moving forward on getting our first net phones. Um, I think we're getting pretty close to that and hope the next report I have is that they're up and running. Um, I also met with the football, or football, sorry, I need more coffee, guys. Foothill Police Chief regarding the um, trying to move our trailer from Loyola Station over near to the Ark. Um, I'll have, should have a good update for that next month. Uh, we've done a recon activity um, looking at different areas of our hills and seeing number one where we have some ham radio connection issues and also looking at some of the roads are maybe not as safe for some of us to go on when we do our recon activities i.e no uh you know no ways to get you know in and out very well um you know dirt lots things like that so we're really uh, been been doing some recon around that as well um, I also helped um, Denise moderate the evacuation workshop meeting we had and we've had a couple of survey refreshers and um, what else have I done? Red, shelter, uh, Red Cross shelter training has been this, this month. So we've gotten some updates on that. Um, also too, hopefully at our next meeting, I'll be able to present our new um, refurbished and refreshed uh, Los Altos Hill CERT website. So uh, one of our CERTs, Annie has been um, tirelessly working on uh, making it look um, refreshed and uh, exciting. I think, do I have one more slide, Sarah? I can't remember. Um, oh, upcoming stuff. We're still doing Red Cross training this month. Um, they've made some changes because of COVID. So we're all, uh, even town staff are going to these trainings. Um, again, we're doing our CERT launch meeting tomorrow. Uh, both uh, programs are open for registration. Um, we're gonna be switching to medical operations, which I'm hoping that the Kearneys can um, bless us with their, their experience and their knowledge. Uh, for our medical operations uh, coming up next month. Um, we're also, I'd like to invite you guys to our, um, we're having a CERT COVID response presentation by Anne DeGeest. She's one of our CERTs and she's gonna go over sort of how, how COVID has affected CERT and what that looks like in our response. Um, so if you guys can make it, it's on March 23rd at 7.30. Other than that, um, I believe this is the end of my report. Uh, any questions? I just had a quick addition too that Victoria we offered out of uh, the Youth Council uh, Stop the Bleed class, which was very popular among the certs. Um, so to again, help the, the youth on getting personally prepared um, and tourniquet use and bleeding control is a, is a newer cert a curriculum addition to, to the update that they did a couple of years ago. So Victoria, just really quick, wanna just uh, tell them about that. It was kind of a uh, gift for attending. 
Sure, thank you. I think I have my slide, but I think I skipped it. Um, yes, yeah, so we offered the Youth Council uh, conference attendees a free Stop the Bleed class in which the district will be paying for their materials for the class, which is basically a tourniquet, some gauze. Um, and um, the, the kids seemed really excited about being able to learn Stop the Bleed. Um, so we have our instructor from Campbell CERT coming to do that on April 24th. Um, so we're going to pass the word on for that too, and hopefully we'll get some uh, attendees. We'll also be putting it out to other teens, uh, teens in the county as well, if they want to take the Stop the Bleed program. And I think that's the end of our report. Thank you very much, Victoria. I want to personally thank you. We've, uh, you know, gone long, long and round and, and really you've done an amazing job. So thank you. Let me just uh, really put that out there. I'm here. Thank you very much for being so motivational in, in your teen community. So thank you again. And to report if there's any questions, uh, we'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tyson has a question. Yes, thank you. A really nice uh, report. Boy, there's so much going on. I'm really proud of this organization. Captain Guhan, um, I appreciated seeing the six steps for a FireWise community. Uh, can you tell, is there, is there a, a guideline or a, a recommended sweet spot for how large a FireWise community should be? Like five houses, 50 houses, 500 houses. Like where's the, where's the best size? The maximum is 60 individual residences. Um, and again, with that zone haven that I mentioned a little bit earlier, we want to try to try to help organize that inside of that because that's, again, getting to, if someone has to be evacuated, we would like the evacuation training to go, is the, you know, the introduction to the Firewise education. So we'd really like to get those communities all grouped together. I'd say the sweet, sweet spot is around 30 or 40, um, just because we're on Zoom right now. Normally a lot of this would be done in person, but because of COVID, all actually all of this would have been done in person. But because of COVID, everything is in kind of a, a transitional pivot of sorts and doing the best we can in the tiers that we're in. So uh, doing it remotely. Los Altos Hills is a hard place to get traction because there isn't HOAs specifically like there are in other communities. Uh, so it's, it's kind of hard to get that little bit of traction to get those groups to organize, to become a board. Uh, we start with a minimum usually of 12 homes as a minimum. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Captain Gluhan. Um, anyone else? Any other commissioners have any questions? How about members from the public? Great. I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton. Um, the boss is back, uh, President Warren, and uh, he's going to take over the meeting from here. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you Vice President um, Vaughn, Melvin. Appreciate it uh, carrying it this far. Um, thank you very much. Um, and Mahir, once again, I want to add my um, my two cents to whatever all the other commissioners and staff have said. Um, I think that's great what you're doing, and uh, look forward to seeing this program develop. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic. All right. So with that, thank you, um, Chief Gluhan, Mahir. Um, Sir, program analyst BB, and seeing there's no comments or questions from the commission or the public, we'll now move to item nine, which is the fire hydrant report. Item 9A is the report. General Manager Logan, please provide the report. Uh, thank you, President Warren. Uh, we're going to switch gears now. We've gone from uh, the human interaction, interaction of a fire district. Now we're going to go to the infrastructure. Uh, importance in a fire fire district. And so I'd like to talk with you about the TAFE Elena water main construction project that it's completed. And you'll find in your packet uh, various items, uh, including an invoice that was delivered to the district for payment for that project. The project construction required identification of hydrants and hydrant infrastructure to be moved and this afforded the opportunity for the district to assess the placement, relocation, and addition of hydrants to optimize fire protection. A team of engineers, central fire deputy uh, fire marshals, and district staff walked the area probably about 18 months ago to determine where the hydrants should be located, replaced, or added during the Tafalana water main construction project. Once the construction began, hydrant parts were inspected and reused where appropriate under engineering standards. After completion of the construction, the team again assessed the construction of the district hydrants. As due diligence 
engineering consultant, Jeff Tarantino, provided a detailed report, and the report is in your materials, that confirmed the construction and the charges to the district. And so at this point, I'm going to ask Mr. Tar Tarantino, if you could walk us through the report, because I think it's just exceptionally well done and shows the due diligence on behalf of the district and on the question of the fire hydrant uh, interaction with Persima Hills Water District to make sure that uh, we have a good report of how those fire hydrants have been relocated, replaced, or the additions made. So Mr. Tarantino, it's all yours. Thank you, General Manager Logan. Uh, Sarah, would you be able to bring up the, uh, the report? Um, so as General Manager Logan stated, um, we uh, assisted the district in, or in confirming that the Tape Elena Moody uh, project was properly constructed. Um, excuse me, one second. Apologies, we almost had a guest uh, from, from my household here. So, um, <laughs> we, uh, so as, as Dr. Manager Logan stated, the, um, the team prior to FNL's involvement um, did work the site uh, with uh, the <coughs> Christmas Hills Water District team, um, which consisted of their operations staff and representatives from Potcore Consulting Group who uh, provided the design engineering services. So when we were notified that construction was completed, uh, a team from my office, along with uh, Captain Gluhan, we performed a post-construction final inspection walk. Uh, the purpose of that walk was to review the field conditions, uh, verify that all of the district hydrants that were either relocated and reused uh, or new hydrants that were installed based on um, identification of uh, improved uh, fire hydrant density were properly installed in location and then documented those conditions. And so as a means of documenting our, our inspection, as well as reviewing and, and confirming uh, the invoice from Prince Mills Water District, uh, we prepared the, the memo that's on the screen here. And so, Sarah, if you could just kind of scroll through a little slowly here. So we developed a summary of the purpose of the project, the purpose of the district, uh, and uh, documented uh, our efforts uh, through, through the, um, uh, site review. And so as we continue uh, through the memo, um, we went ahead and, and documented the existing um, uh, the team that was on site, including representatives from FNL and, uh, and Director Glu uh, Captain Gluhan, as well as members from Persma Hills Water District. And really what we wanted to accomplish here was, as we go to table two on the next page, Sarah, is understanding each of the 16 hydrants uh, district owned hydrants that were, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to use the word kind of touch as part of this project. Again, there was a, a, a multiple uses, either reusing existing hydrants, uh, simply kind of relocating that hydrant to facilitate construction. Um, but we also installed three new hydrants as part of this work. Those hydrant locations were selected during the initial uh, design site walk, uh, and, and they were selected. Uh, in collaboration with uh, district staff and fire marshal's office to, imp to improve uh, uh, fire hydrant spacing density to improve fire suppression. Uh, and as we continue um, through the, the final summary here, as we validated the, the district infrastructure that was installed, uh, the pricing um, from the invoicing to confirm that the total charges of 167,300 uh, were reasonable and consistent with the uh, infrastructure shown to be improved on the construction drawings and uh, field verified uh, by FNL. And so if we can keep scrolling through here, I wanted to, um, we basically selected select sheets from the construction documents. And Sarah, could you, I think it's about the third or fourth page from here. Um, you'll see we, uh, next page there, as we identified the improvements, we took photo documentation, noting the location, noting the um, bid items that the, that the improvements were, were paid for. And the, and the goal of this doc, you know, kind of detailed documentation is to allow the district to continue to develop their asset management database so that we have photo documentation of uh, hydrants that are installed, uh, their conditions that they're installed in, and as well as the year of installation. Uh, so, you know, as we continue to work with Prisma Hills uh, on future capital improvement projects, we'll continue to do this documentation to uh, further improve the, the district's um, uh, documentation and, and, and uh, uh, 
coordination of, of uh, infrastructure management. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions the commissioners may have. Are there any questions from commissioners? All right, hearing none. Um, General Major Logan, anything else on this before we move on through the approval process? No, I'm just very proud of the uh, process that we're using. And I think that this process is very responsive to the management audit recommendations 1.1 and to ensure that the expenditures of district funds are for district assets. And with that, I would recommend approval by the Board of Commissioners to um, uh, allow the payment of the invoice for $167,300. Thank you. Great, thank you, General Manager Logan. And yes, I appreciate the, the diligence and the documentation here that, that clearly puts into the public record how the funds were spent and you know, for public benefit. So thank you very much. Yes. Um, all right. Are there any clarifying questions from the commission? Hearing none, I will now entertain a motion to for 9A to reimburse uh, for the cost of these um, fire hydrant work. In a motion from a commissioner and a second, please. Tyson will move um, authorization of the payment as noted in this item. Second from Vaughn. Second from Vaughn. Thank you. All right, the item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? All right, I'm hearing none. President, is there any President yes. I would just add for the record that it includes appro approval of the reimbursement agreement as well as the invoice. All right, thank you. Include is as district council noted there. Thank you very much. Is there any public comment on this item? All right, hearing none, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call vote. President Warren. Approved. Vice President Vaughn. Yes. Commissioner Kearney. Commissioner Kearney. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, yes. Right. That's okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Right. And the motion passes six to zero. Great. Thank you very much. All right, we will now move to item 10, Integrated Hazardous Fuel Reduction Report. Um, item 10A is the update. Um, Emergency Services Manager Gluhan, please introduce the item. Thank you, President Warren. Uh, so on this item uh, tonight, we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, defensible space brush chipping. I'll have Sarah Hendricks start with that. Then I will follow up with home ignition zone and shaded fuel break project update. Sarah. Thank you, Captain Gluhan and good evening commissioners, uh, staff, presenters and members of the public. Uh, I just wanna provide a brief depth update on some modifications that we're making to the defensible space brush chipping program. Uh, in light of feedback that we've received from residents, fire safe council, contractors, and observations that we've made over the past year of the program. So as background for the new commissioners, the Defensible Space Brush Chipping Program is a premier service that we offer to district residents. The service is offered to residents two times a year at no cost and encourages residents to create defensible space around structures on their property and to reduce fire fuels by utilizing techniques of shelter and yard, property hygiene and property and structure hardening. To promote these activities, the district contracts with Fire Safe Council to chip and dispose of hazardous materials associated with property hygiene and hardening efforts. Fire Safe Council manages the program by inspecting, measuring, photographing, and tagging residents' piles, constructing and issuing RFPs based on cubic yards of brush and the number of registrants, and working with contractors to execute the program. Currently, residents are given the option of three two-week chipping windows each month. With each of those windows comes its own set of deadlines for registration, a deadline for when piles must be ready, and a reference date for when Fire Safe Council will inspect the piles. There is typically a one to two-week lag between when the piles are tagged for bidding and when they are actually chipped. 
Additionally, RFPs are constructed by Fire Safe Council for each of those three two week service windows. So to streamline this process, beginning with April services, so just a few short weeks away, we're going to be offering just one two week service window. Residents need only to sign up to participate and have their piles ready the day before the window starts. Fire Safe Council will construct one RFP for the whole month based on the number of registrants and historical data to provide an estimate of the cubic yards of brush to be chipped. Residents will receive a courtesy email or phone call from Fire Safe Council once their actual chipping date is scheduled. And rather than inspecting and tagging the piles ahead of time, a Fire Safe Council representative will accompany the selected contractor during the chipping days to measure piles, oversee chipping and cleanup, and ensure a reliable and effective service for residents. We're hopeful that these changes will produce the following. Um, we're going to hopefully see increased competitive bidding, increased resident participation based on the simple, clear service instructions, and improved quality of service due to direct oversight by Fire Safe Council during chipping days. The monthly mailers for April reflect these changes to the service window options, but residents should be relatively unaffected by the changes to the bidding process. Additionally, we're now soliciting informal feedback from program participants by including a link to a brief satisfaction survey at the end of each service completion email that uh, residents receive from Fire Safe Council. The survey has been live since February 26th, and as of yesterday, I believe, we've had 24 responses so far. 100% of respondents rated their level of satisfaction with the program as great and ranked their level service level of service at four to five out of five. We hope that the new formatting will provide even better service in the coming month. That's the end of my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Go ahead, George. Um, I, I missed one point there I, and I, I like what I hear in terms of speeding it up and making it so that the brush piles don't sit. How do they bid if you don't actually measure the pile beforehand? So we're going to have a deadline for when residents have to register for the program. So that will give us a pretty accurate number of households that contractors will be providing service for. And then we'll be using historical data from the past year uh, to give kind of an estimate of what we expect the cubic yardage to be. Okay. And contractors have actually had some communications with Fire Safe Council and we've talked to them about those estimates. And so they know that there is gonna be a range uh, and we do plan on accounting for um, a, a percent increase of, you know, based on the data that we have from the past year. Thank you. Um, Sarah, you might mention that we're only invoiced on the actual cubic yards. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, very important point. Uh, so once we receive the invoice, it'll be based on how many uh, cubic yards of brush are actually chipped. Um, but we'll get, we'll get an estimate of how much they think it will cost them to complete the service. So maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Great. Any further questions from the commission? What I want to do is, if there's no questions from the commission, well, before we move to the next topic, any qu comments, questions from the public on this change to the program? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Captain Gluhan? Yeah, so thank you, Sarah. And again, that, that year that we have been doing, um, as uh, Commissioner Tyson had mentioned, um, it's, it's really helped us be able to kind of predict um, what we need to do to make this more efficient and get enough contractors to come and bid. So thank you, Sarah, for collecting that data, Fire Safe Council for helping us so that we can kind of uh, make this as streamlined and as efficient as possible and being a good use of the uh, monies that we're spending on this uh, defensible space uh, brush chipping program. So really quick moving on, uh, not a lot to report on the home ignition zone inspection. Um, I have uh, been in contact with Eugenia Randler who is running that uh, program. When we were initially doing the inspections inside COVID, we were in the orange tier. We jumped straight from the orange tier to the purple tier. And now we've gone back to the red tier. So we didn't go right back to the orange. So they're trying to find in between the restrictions, if that's a program that we can go ahead and, and continue as quasi essential between and the red tier. So that's being decided. And if it's not until we move up to a better tier like the orange, 
uh, we're looking at some alternative methods to deliver that program service, maybe remotely uh, with some sort of adaptation. Um, and I already alluded to the Shaded Fuel Bake project. Again, those are ongoing uh, meetings that I'm having with both fire uh, agency representatives and fire safe council, and then other agencies around the area to kind of identify our evacuation routes. We will be completing our next project probably in the north side of the district, and then we'll be looking for the, our next project after that into the south end of the district, uh, more in the unincorporated area, or at least the south end. So that ends my report, and if there's any questions, um, thank you. Great. Thank you, Captain Glohan. All right, so that takes us, um, is there any discussion from the commission? Is there any public comment on this item? All right, we'll move on to item 10B, always a crowd favorite, which is professional services agreement with ecosystem concepts for goat gra grazing services. General Manager Logan, please provide the report. Thank you, President Warren. And I do recommend approval of this professional services agreement for our uh, vegetation management by goat grazing. It's been a hallmark of the district for many springs and the memorandum report, which is attached to the materials, provides this background and information. Over 400 goats, the herders and their, uh, their herding dogs will arrive in the district sometime between the end of this meeting and June to do the goat grazing. It depends upon schedules and weather and various components. And so we have that open-ended uh, timeline for the goats to, to come. They usually stay about two weeks and they munch their way to vegetation mitigation. And the wonderful part about this solution to vegetation mitigation is it, it, is, it is environmentally protective and it's very bucolic. And I think it's one of the things that puts a smile on our face as a fire district when we deal with a lot of daunting tasks to know that the goats are coming. The only thing I would say that Captain Gluhan and I uh, stay up nights about worrying is when someone gives us a call at the oddest times of the day and says, your goats are out and it's not our goats, it's someone else's goats because everyone's bringing in the goats during the spring. And so far, knock on wood, we've been lucky to have our goats restrained through their electric fences and we haven't, haven't had to go chase them. So uh, that's the end of my report. Uh, welcome any questions, thank you. Thank you, General Manager Logan. Um, my only request is, is that if we do approve this, please let the commission know when the goats are on site so we can go go visit the goats. <laughs> All right, are there any clarifying questions from the commission? All right, I will now entertain a motion. We need a motion. Spring moves. All right, thank you, Roger. I need a second, please. Sherlock seconds. Thank you, Joan. All right, the item is now, this is item 10B. The item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? Hearing none, is there any public comment on this item? All right, hearing none, there's no further discussion. We'll now move to vote on item 10B. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call vote. President Warren. Yes. Vice President Vaughn. Yes. Commissioner Kearney. Yes. Commissioner Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. The motion passes six to zero. Great. Thank you, Corey. All right. We'll now move to item 11, financial consultant report. All right, Corey, change the hat. All right. Now we're on to the... Um, Item 11A through C are the reports. Financial consultant and District Clerk Vargas, please provide the reports. Thank you, President Warren. And I think from now on, I'd like to be referred to as the uh, FCDC, kind of sounds like a rock band. Um, but <laughs> So um, I am going to uh, review uh, reports 11A and 11C. Um, as in the consent calendar, you remember I pulled or asked for 11B to be pulled and presented at April's meeting. Um, so 11A is the revised fiscal year 22 draft budget. Um, and there have been following changes that 
from the draft budget that I presented at the February 16th meeting. Uh, first change, I accidentally counted insurance premiums, the 40,000 twice into the grand total. So uh, we've removed that double doubling there. Um, and then the cost allocation plan expenditures were reduced down to 59,994. And so, uh, on the screen before you is the uh, final draft budget that was presented or delivered to OBA and accepted by OBA. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, this will be presented to the uh, Hewlett committee at their April meeting for review. Um, it, it won't be at the April meeting. It will be at a, a subsequent meeting whenever the various Hewlett budgets are all ready. And the fire district is one of the Hewlett um, districts or one of the one of the districts reporting to Hewlett. Thank, Thank you for you. clarification. Okay and then uh, 11c um, this is the uh, the form 700 uh, statements of economic interest. Um, I have three forms that are pending. Uh, one of those is actually completed. It's being mailed to me and the other two have been sent reminder emails to file by April 1st. And that is um, all I have for items 11A and 11C, if there are any questions. What about 11B, the narrative? 11B is, is moved on, on the consent, oh, consent. Yeah, you weren't here, you. Uh, but we're thank moving back to April. <laughs> all right. So that's 11A and C. All right. So. Um, then um, what we need to do is we need to move to 11D, correct? Which is the establishment of the tax override? Yes, okay. So 11D, um, it's to establish the fiscal year 22 special tax override. And I would recommend uh, putting that rate at zero. I just wanna give a quick background on that. Um, so with the passage of Proposition 13 in 78, um, it caused the district to lose 60% of its property tax revenue. Um, and as a result, the district could not fund its fire protection services. So the district called for a special district election, which passed with the voters and um, an annual fee of $50 was charged to improved residential parcels. The district imposed this tax for approximately four years until the extra funds were no longer required. And since fiscal year 1987, uh, the commission has set the tax override at zero. And again, I recommend doing that again for fiscal year 2022. And that's the end of my report. All right, thank you, District Clerk Vargas. Is there any discussion from the commission? You know, I feel like there's an opportunity for a PR motion here because most of us, if we ever said, is there ever such a thing as a government entity that doesn't grab everything they possibly can from you every chance they get? And I would say, yes, yes, there's one. It's Los Altos <laughs> and Fire District has the ability to charge everybody $50 a parcel and we've decided we didn't, we can get by without it. So we haven't done it. So here, here we are, an example of one and I'm very proud of it. We are first press release this year. I like the catch. <laughs> Thank you, George. All right. Is there any public discussion on this item? All right. Hearing none, we will move. Um, um, all right. President um, Warren. Yeah. It's uh, it's not a typical term that we use the established, but because we are setting the tax rate at zero, I think for the record, it would be nice to have a motion and approval of the board. Yeah, we're going, we're going to do that right now. We're going to okay. uh, get, look for a motion and an approval to set the tax rate at zero for item, for item 11 um, D. So thank you, Chris. And if, you, I, if, if I jump the gun on that, President Warren, I apologize. Appreciate it. No, it was a perfect segue. So um, why don't we do this? So I now, um, uh, so uh, FCDC, thank you for explaining that. Um, so if there are no clarifying questions from the commission, I will now entertain a motion for item 11D to set the tax rate at zero for the upcoming fiscal year, 2021-2022. All right, I'll now entertain a motion. So moved. Commissioner Kearney moved. I need a second, please. I a second. Second. Mr. Tyson seconds. All right, the item is now open for discussion. 
Is there any further discussion from the commission? Is there hearing none? Is there any discussion from the public? All right, hearing none. We will now move to vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Warren. Yes. Vice President Vaughn. Yes. Commissioner Kearney. Yes. Commissioner Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Okay, and the motion passes six to zero. Very good. We'll now move to item 12, which is which we've already visited once this evening, which is the operations and overview. So we'll move to item 12B. Uh, General Manager Logan, we introduce um, Mr. Tarantino, uh, Tarantino again for the second time this evening. Yeah, oh, thank you, President Warren. Be happy to do so. So I'm pleased to introduce District Engineer Consultant Jeff Tarantino with Friar and Loretta uh, Consulting. And he will discuss the district's plans for the district's 540 hydrants and the related hydrant uh, infrastructure. This plan relates to the strategic plan goal four. And the presentation will be on services, projects, and assistance to develop policies and processes for management of district water systems of hydrants and hydrant related infrastructure for protection of property, life safety, and support to fire uh, fire suppression systems. And this topic goes very nicely with Chief Glass's uh, uh, long report on uh, operations of central fire because to have the operations for fire suppression, obviously we need water and the district provides that water through its fire hydrant systems 400 and 540. The other parts of the district fire hydrant systems are operated through Cal water systems. So with that introduction, thank you, uh, Jeff Tarantino, it's all yours. Hey, thank you, General Manager uh, Logan and, and President Warren. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the commission tonight. Um, so uh, tonight, again, I'll actually just to introduce myself. Uh, I don't think I did it the first time. Uh, Jeff Tarantino, I'm a vice president with Friar and Loretta and uh, we have the pleasure of serving as the on-call engineering consultant for the district. And so this evening, uh, Jay asked that I speak to you about, uh, you know, the, the various uh, activities that FNL has been assisting the district with. So first we'll talk a little bit about um, my firm's role in, in providing technical support to, to the district. Uh, do a brief uh, overview of the history of the hydrants in the district, including the various agreements uh, that established responsibilities for the district. Um, we'll then um, review the policies and procedures uh, that we are beginning to develop uh, in concert with uh, district staff and uh, Central Fire. Um, we'll then uh, review some of the fire hydrant system activities, including uh, looking at some of the, the work previously completed uh, over the last six to eight months. Uh, and then we'll get into the, the uh, ongoing asset management um, that the district is responsible for. And then finally, we'll, we'll open up the floor for discussion and questions. So uh, next slide. Uh, so, FNL's role, we, we really provide a kind of a, a, a range of services to support the district. Um, you, those services are, uh, you know, they're technical services, engineering design, um, project management, making sure projects are getting done. And then uh, also something called that, that, that I refer to as program management. So uh, assisting the, the general manager, kind of reviewing policies, uh, working with staff. And so it's something kind of, you know, providing kind of the, the engineering and technical uh, ex expertise that, that my team brings. Um, through the overall operation and, and uh, functioning of the district. Um, we, we do work at the direction of the, of the general manager to, to work with district staff, uh, but not only are we working with district staff, but we're coordinating with a, a number of partners, uh, Central Fire, Preston Hills Water District, Town of Los Altos Hills, Cal Water. And, and so it's really you know, recognizing the importance of collaborating with each, each of these partners um, through the various projects that, uh, that, that the district is moving forward with. We also need to work, you know, with you, the commission, um, you know, as we as we develop the policies and procedures, uh, it, assisting with the management uh, audit guidelines. It, it, that way, we have a clear set of policies that will that will guide, you know, in, in my kind of world here, guide the the ongoing operation and maintenance of the district-owned uh, fire hydrants, the 540 hydrants that uh, General Manager Logan described. And finally, you know, evaluate and assist uh, with asset management. So that's not only uh, the hydrants, uh, but as we talked to towards the end of the presentation, it's also a district owned parcel uh, within Los Altos Hills. So first wanted to, um, I know there was a question from the, from the public about, uh, you know, 
why is the district in, in the business of hybrids? And it's really, you know, kind of a unique condition. So there was an initial agreement in 1956 between the Board of Supervisors and Person Hills Water District uh, that outlined the district's responsibilities for hydrants. So really at that time, um, the Los Santos Hills was being developed, uh, you know, parcels were being converted from farmland, Person Hills was beginning to construct a uh, water system and the fire district uh, identified the need to, to add hydrants to the Personal Hill system in order to provide si fire suppression uh, for, for the uh, residents within the district. Then 1980, uh, an additional agreement was executed that further defined the responsibilities of, of, of the fire district, including proper operation to ensure consistency with, with fire protection. So what that means is uh, really making sure not, not only that as fire hydrants are installed to, to improve fire suppression capabilities, but making sure that those remain functional. And so what that, what that means for the district is, uh, again, inspection and checking of hydrants that's done in concert with central fire operations, um, coordinating with Person Hills Water District when they're implementing any kind of improvement project, uh, whether that will, will uh, affect uh, our infrastructure, uh, reviewing those plans, making sure they're done, being done in accordance with general accepted practice, using materials uh, that are acceptable to the district, and looking for opportunities to reuse fire hydrants like we discussed on, on my previous report. Um, but we also, when we are coordinating with uh, personal hills and, and, and um, when they're implementing any capital projects, looking for opportunities to improve fire suppression when appropriate. And finally, because we are responsible for the hydrants, again, within the Personal Hills Water District. So this doesn't apply to those hydrants that are uh, within the Cal Water Service area, but when a fire hydrant is damaged, it is the district's responsibility to, to implement repairs uh, it, as quick as feasible uh, to, to reduce the time that a fire hydrant is out of service. Uh, next slide, Sarah. So our focus uh, when, when looking at the hydrants really is consistent with strategic plan goal four, um, as, as General Manager uh, Logan described. And so one of the first steps that we've been implementing um, during this, this year is developing a series of policies and procedures. So when we look at all the different components, you know, what does it take to maintain the existing system? What does it take to evaluate opportunities for improving fire suppression? So looking at increasing fire hydrant density, um, and then just ongoing coordination with, you know, Personal Hills Water District, Town of Los Altos Hills. Um, and, it, you know, there, there's a lot of different moving parts and pieces um, that we've really been learning a lot about and, you know, working through with our partners. Um, and it's really time to start kind of formalizing those policies and procedures so that there's guidance for, for staff as we, as we move forward. Um, so next slide. So what does it mean to develop these policies and procedures? So um, working with General Manager Logan, we, we outlined a process of um, really kind of a two-part process. The first uh, it, that we accomplished in February was what we refer to as the Information Gathering Task Force. So we gathered all of our, our partners, uh, Central Fire with Operations and the Fire Marshal's Office, uh, Personnel's Water District, and town staff. And what our goal during that meeting was really to, to walk through uh, with, with each of the partners at the table and discuss the interaction that uh, the district has with each of those partner agencies. And we talked about what wor what's worked well, what are things that could be improved, opportunities for um, uh, ad additional coordination. Um, that way we really have a kind of a nice record of how we have worked together collaboratively with, with our partners. From there, we've now moved forward to a smaller working group. Um, and yeah, we could stay on this slide, Sarah, thank you. Um, smaller working group consisting of district staff, so uh, General Manager Logan, Captain Gluhan, uh, members from FNL, and we will be engaging the fire marshal's office from Central Fire. And we're really going to try to um, develop a really streamline um, policies that really identify the purpose of the policy, the goal of the procedure, the process for that procedure, and then any documentation, um, including templates that may be important to, to a guiding um, implementation of the policy. So like the memo that we looked at under, under item nine, where FNL did our site walk, documented what we observed, you know, uh, prepared records of, of the improvements in the field, 
that is one of our templates that, that we'll be um, continuing to refine so that it really informs staff moving forward how we are going to interact with personal health SDR, uh, you know, planning, design, and construction of an improvement project. And ultimately, once we develop the draft policies and procedures, we'll be bringing those to the commissioners uh, for review. So that again, you know, kind of fulfilling one of our roles as your uh, consultant, um, provide kind of pro program management guidance uh, um, on a policy level so that as we move forward with our, with our uh, new policies and procedures, it's, it's something that is a, is a reference tool that, um, as Kathy Gruhan has said many times, you know, if somebody has a question, what do I do when there's a fire hydrant break? Well, you know, we can pull out our binder and hand them the policy and, and we know what to do. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about um, fire hydrant replacements. So, you know, there's lots of reasons why we are gonna uh, implement work related to fire hydrants. So uh, on the right hand side of your screen here, you see some photos from a fire hydrant break um, that occurred at the intersection of Altamont and Black Mountain Road. And so uh, what, uh, what our friends at Prisma Hills found after receiving a call from the Sheriff's Department that there was a hydrant was struck, uh, you see uh, in, in that photo, uh, we had a, a, a geyser of water that needed to be uh, shut off. So the fire hydrant in this case, um, the fire hydrant itself was not damaged, but the uh, break off check valve did not function properly, which resulted in the, in the water being released. So, so we evaluated that, um, th that, that improvement and then, and then developed a, a solution to, to restore that fire hydrant back to service. So how did we do that? In this case, what we've been doing historically is doing an individual project by project basis. What I mean by that is um, anytime a fire hydrant is struck and a repair is required, uh, FNL develops uh, a series of, uh, of drawings and specifications that outlines what the work to be performed that's been issued for, for an informal bid, uh, assuming that those, those costs are gonna be under $10,000. And then we select the, the lowest responsive bidder and, and that, that bidder goes forward and completes the work. What we're doing to streamline that process is we're actually developing uh, an, an on-call bid package, meaning um, a, a series of technical requirements uh, for potential scope items where that package will be is issued to bid, uh, we'll receive bids, and then um, working with county council's office, we'll select the lowest responsive bidder, uh, and that will provide us with the ability to um, streamline the process when a fire hydrant is damaged. Um, so that once we know hydrant is damaged, we can notify our on-call contractor and there will be requirements for how quickly they are expected to, to respond and repair uh, the hydrant, whether it's simply reinstalling the hydrant if the uh, breakoff check valve functions properly, or if in the condition at Altamont, if there's a significant damage, actually removing and replacing the, the damaged check valve and then reinstalling the hydrant. Uh, next slide. Another condition, um, as, as an agency that's responsible for over 540 hydrants and, and the associated laterals or gate valves, sometimes things just reach the end of their useful, useful life. So we had a, a, a condition on Viscano Road in the fall of 2020, where uh, water was seen um, essentially leaking from, from uh, uh, the shutoff valve. And so the photo on the right-hand side there, you can see water actively um, being released from the, from the valve. So what we determined through just kind of site observations and, and talking with uh, Prison Hills Water District is that we had a leak somewhere on our lateral. So uh, if Sarah, could you scroll to the next slide? So FNL, uh, after reviewing the site conditions, we developed a series of construction documents and requirements that, that showed that not only did we have to replace the valve that was leaking uh, close to the hydrant. So that hydrant is, you know, the yellow, uh, yellow hydrant on the right hand side of the image in the middle of the screen, but we actually had to replace the entire lateral all the way to Prisma Hills, Maine in order to properly repair and restore the hydrant back into service. So that required a series of coordination with Prisma Hills, including uh, there, because we had to do work on the main in order to re replace the, the fire hydrant T, the lateral, the, the T that serves the fire hydrant lateral, um, and was gonna require Prisma Hills to shut down their main temporarily. We had to go through review and approvals through, through Prisma Hills. We solicited bids from three contractors and ultimately C2R Engineering was selected to um, perform the work. And so, Sarah, would you mind scrolling to the next slide? And so here's just kind of a, a few pictures of the series of work where we had excavation uh, to expose and remove the damaged uh, lateral and T, uh, installation of the new, new lateral in the middle photo there. And then finally, uh, 
backfilling and, and, and paving in accordance with town uh, requirements. And we have our uh, uh, properly functioning hydrant there on the right. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so that, you know, want to talk a little bit about coordination with Chris Mahill. So, uh, you know, when we have fire hydrant repairs, there's varying level of interaction with Chris, Mah with Chris Mahill. They are typically one of the first agencies on site after there is a fire hydrant strike. And so after they've uh, assessed the, the, the damage, they notify uh, the district and then um, we'll go out there and, and about, do a, a detailed evaluation of the fire hydrant damage and, and de develop the repair plan. Um, Another point of interaction with Chris Mahills is when they're planning a, a, a capital improvement project. So we are working with Chris Mahills to receive timely notification of any planned work so that um, uh, our team can do an assessment of the, of the limits of the proposed work, document the uh, number and location of uh, district owned fire hydrants that will be impacted by the work, including doing an initial evaluation of where there might be opportunities to add hydrants to improve um, density for fire suppression purposes. Um, we're going to then notify Persima Hills of, you know, here's kind of where we see potential opportunities for, for work and how we see work going forward. And then establish the, the process for a site walk once uh, Persima Hills has developed, the, the, you know, typically about a 90% level completion design, um, confirming the scope uh, associated with, with uh, district owned fire hydrants. And then post construction, going through the final site walk to confirm that everything was built properly so that. Um, Ultimately, when the cost sharing agreement for, for any work is developed, um, that, or excuse me, cost reimbursement agreement is developed, uh, that uh, all the charges are proper and related to um, improvements uh, or um, relocation of the district owned assets. Uh, and, and part of that will, um, when the opportunity presents itself and, and appropriate, um, improving um, fire suppression capabilities for the district. Uh, next slide. And so um, we, we looked at one of these slides. Uh, this was similar uh, exhibits from the memo that we looked at on um, item nine from earlier this evening. Again, documenting the improvements in a kind of a, a, a tabular format to assist with our uh, asset management in, in importing the GIS system ultimately, as well as photo documentation of, of the uh, finished conditions. So we have that for our reference. Uh, next slide. And so, so we've talked about you know, the policies and procedures for, for, for maintaining and, and uh, improving uh, the district's assets. Um, we've talked about you know, what we do when an asset is damaged. Um, and then we also talked about um, when, when an, uh, one of our partner agencies is gonna impact our asset and, and we have to, we have to you know, react and coordinate with that. Um, we also need to do asset documentation. You know, one of the things that the district staff have been working towards is um, developing our, our database and documenting what we own, how old is it, when was it installed, uh, what condition is it in, um, and making sure that we have that information available to share with our partners, in particular central fire operations. And so we're working with district staff uh, to, to you know, develop our documentation of, of, of all the information available about district assets. Um, and then uh, you know, see how that could be integrated into the ongoing GIS project that the district is implementing. Next slide. So one of the, one of the items, uh, uh, data points that we've been able to review and are, are um, um, compiling is um, there were uh, an eight phase project to replace, um, I believe it was over 300 of the district's existing hydrants. So we are going through and documenting um, the, the hydrants that were replaced uh, through review of the construction documents prepared by um, Pocklore Consulting Group um, on behalf of the district. And we'll be able to share that information um, uh, and, and, get, and provide that to the, to the GIS consultant so that we can incorporate um, that, inf that information and make it available as needed with our, with our partners. This will allow us to really understand the age of a large portion of the district owned fire hydrant system such that when Person Hills comes back with a, with a project, um, we can look for opportunities to, to reuse uh, existing infrastructure that is in still good working shape, is in, is in old, doesn't warrant replacement, so that we're, we're effectively using um, district funds um, to, to maintain different district infrastructure. Uh, next slide. And finally, um, an, one of our other projects to, uh, is the district owned parcel 
uh, it, along Iraq Scudero. So um, working with uh, General Manager Logan and uh, Emergency Services uh, uh, Captain uh, Gluham, looking at how we can um, improve any site security as needed uh, for the district owned parcel, as well as working with Captain Gluham um, to, to lay out potential staging opportunities for emergency vehicles. And so that's an ongoing project that we're working on to support um, the district. And with that, I think that might be my last slide. Yep. So that's the end of my report and I'm happy to answer any questions or participate in any discussion. Hi, Jeff. All right, any questions from the fellow commissioners? Uh, yes, President, I have a question. Please. Yes, Jeff, um, in the original agreement between um, Los Altos Hills and the county, um, it talked about uh, uh, water systems, hydrants, and or and pipe as well. And so I know you're going to address that in your, your policy and that. And so as um, I'm not sure if you sat in um, and, and, and heard the beginning of the meeting, when we're talking about going back to WUI standards. Um, I personally like to see um, if we can get clarification um, with, you know, through Chris's office uh, on whether or not um, replacing antiquated and uh, inefficient undersized um, piping in some of the most affected areas uh, in which we serve. And so <clears throat> I know that's a little bit of a, um, uh, a sore subject, <laughs> so, so to speak, but it's something that I think that we really should be able to address should address um, as quickly as possible as well because the WUI standards uh, under new construction all new buildings would have to be sprinklered and with some of the current water pressures that we have here based off of the size of the pipe and the age of the pipe um, we would never meet those standards and so um, so it's twofold so I know we're not in the business per se to augment um, some of the water providers um, pipes that they own, but maybe <clears throat> some sort of agreement can be um, reached where, you know, they lease them from us or, or something. But that's something that's, um, I think that this community really, really needs to, to address. So that's it. Uh, yep. Thank you, Commissioner Vaughn. I'll, um, Jay or, or Chris, is there yep. anything to respond or just information we'll, we'll take on and, and research? Thank you, Melvin. Commissioner Logan's got that one. Yeah, General Manager, yeah. Um, uh, Vice President Vaughn, yes, I, I know that as you're aligned with a strategic goal four, which is that maintenance and the whole hydrant and hydrant infrastructure um, uh, responsibility for the district, this is a very important question. And let us work out a plan, get back and have those kinds of discussions. Great. Thank you, General Manager Logan. That. Any further questions? Um, Alan, please. Alan, from the public, get your hand raised. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, as uh, you may or may not know, uh, Parisma Hills Water District represents less than 50% of the fire district. And in the other 50% of the fire district, the fire district has little to no involvement with the hydrant system um, other, when, other than when uh, uh, main lines are being replaced. Um, I strongly suggest that the fire district try to get out of the hydrant business. No other fire departments are in the hydrant business. It's highly unusual. It's uh, largely duplicative work because um, FNL was basically borrowing the information that PACPOR developed. Um, and so the information is readily available. And the water district is the first person notified and far more accomplished at dealing with the water system than is the fire district. So my recommendation is rather to spend all this money um, on what I consider to be make work um, is to sit down and negotiate with the water district what it would take to get out of the hydrant business and see whether or not that would be more cost effective and more efficient than going through this motion of attempting to do this documentation. 
for 70 years, this fire district has uh, quote, been in the hydrant business. Um, the hydrants got replaced without FNL. The hydrants got maintained without FNL. And um, none of the hydrants walked away as far as I know. So the, uh, there wasn't a concern about the acid management. And when it comes time to replace a hydrant, it doesn't really matter how long ago it was put in. All it matters is what its current condition is. And you go out and take a look and see what its current condition is and then make a determination whether it can be uh, reused or not. So I strongly recommend for both uh, efficiencies and operations that the fire district attempt to get out of the hydrant business. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your comment, Alan. All right, any further questions from the public? Any further questions from the commission? All right, Jeff, I have one further question because I'm a geek and I'm, I'm curious, what's your background? Uh, this is a uh, 2 million gallon wet weather flow equalization basin that is now in operation underneath the uh, Pacifica Community Center parking lot that FNL was the designer for. And uh, it was much cooler background than just some, one of the standard 120 units, so I thought I'd throw it up there. Very interesting. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for the discussion, commissioners. If there's no further comments, we'll close out item 12 and we'll move to item 13, which is commission member reports. All right, moving to item 13. Item A is future agenda items, which include a report from the Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council um, and a report from MRG on the 2021-2022 strategic plan and goals. General Manager Logan, would you like to provide any comments on this topic? Uh, thank you, President Warren. In April, um, I'm hoping to provide items for overview of upcoming programs and projects with Fire Safe Council for fire safety and protection. And then also, hopefully, we'll have a presenter from Zone Haven about uh, the county evacuation plans, at that platform and how it relates to the district. And then staff, we'll start our staff reports of strategic goal implementation, implementations from the aligned commissioners and staff. So uh, what I'm hoping is that every subsequent meeting will have a bit of time devoted to certain topics can be looked at in more detail than just the action or the report topics that we, we currently have had on the agendas. So that will be a part of the, um, of the agenda and I think it's very well positioned to do that. So thank you. Great, thank you General Manager Logan. Are there any other commission member items? Yes, Roger. Just a uh, sort of a, early notice that uh, as part of the strategic plan work I'm doing, uh, we were looking at the budget process and how to make sure that's really continues to be transparent and involving and inclusive. And one of the things we're strongly considering is asking for a uh, budget only commissioner public meeting uh, at the start of the budget cycle so that we actually have time to focus on it rather than sort of having it at item 12 of a 20 item agenda in November, uh, much like the town of Los Altos Hills does, they have a special meeting devoted just to budget items. So we think that might be able to really uh, help address any of the issues we come up with from strategic plan discussions. And I'm just sitting this now to put it in our minds. We'll talk about it more specifically in the coming months. It would be something like November or October, but just so you hear it now, that's all. Very good. Thank you, Roger. All right, any other commission member items? Seeing none, um, there's any public comment on these items? All right, seeing none, we'll now move to item 14. I wanna thank uh, Vice President Vaughn for covering for me for the first hour. Thank you everyone for the, the staff for prepping today's meeting, uh, another productive meeting. And hopefully at some point in the future, we'll all be able to get together as and not on Zoom. Don't know when that'll be, but um, with that, we should move for adjournment. It, this concludes the, unless there's any final comments.
All right, then this concludes the March 16th, 2021 regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. The meeting is adjourned at 9.28 p.m. The next regular meeting will take place via Zoom April 20th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Special Project Services Consultant Hendricks, please stop the recording.